This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st Century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And good evening. I just listened to that whole introduction myself for the first time and realized it dates me. It suggests I've been studying UFOs for 50 years, which must mean I'm like 107 or something. Uh, I'm really only 25, for those of you who really want to know. Anyway... I will be joined tonight by Rob Zwiatek, who has an undergraduate degree in physics and spent his career at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office working on intellectual property in a number of areas, most importantly in aeronautics and astronomics, which means he was working on circular aircraft for the USO, U.S. government. I didn't say USO for some reason. His UFO involvement goes back to 1968, during what he calls his larval stage, when there were ongoing sightings throughout the country and the University of Colorado UFO study permanently nailed his attention. Once he arrived in the Washington, D.C. area with the PTO, he joined the Fund for UFO Research and subsequently was elected to their executive committee. Around 2006, as the fund wound down to the rise of the Internet and other factors, although it still exists as an organization, but it's uh, largely dormant, he was asked to join the MUFON board of directors and continue to serve there to this day. So he is well-rounded in the uh, study of UFOs. He's been around the study uh, almost as long as I have, which means he knows an awful lot about UFOs. At least we hope so. So welcome, Rob. Hi, Kevin. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's a it's a pleasure to be here on the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor and, and to be talking about UFOs with you. And if, if you've been around for 107 years, I guess I've been around for 105. So that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, sobering. Yes, that's, uh, that's, that's frightening when I look back and, and realize, you know, I was there to actually witness uh, on television the, the, announcement of the Lonnie Zamora sighting, for example. And I remember oh, wow. I was growing I was growing up in Colorado when they announced the University of Colorado was doing the UFO study and was very excited about that, which did me no good because not long after their announcement, uh, I graduated from high school, which again dates me and ended up in the U.S. Army. So I didn't have the mm-hmm. opportunity to interact with them at all like I would have. So that, that, yeah, kind, of, that kind of dates me on that. 
but you have mm-hmm. a you have a strong interest in ufology that goes back as long as I do. What what uh, really sparked your interest besides the University of uh, Colorado study? What what site was there a sighting that kind of sparked it or something you saw? <laughs> There wasn't. Uh, there, there wasn't, Kevin. Uh, there wasn't a particular sighting or anything like that. I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say, say this, but, uh, but I know I'm in good company with a lot of other people in the UFO field, uh, whose names I won't mention at this point. But w- one of the first things I read in the field was the famous George Adamski book, Flying Saucers Have Landed, and that was sub- somewhat before 1968 that I read that. And you know that kind of stuff started uh, piquing my interest actually. And uh, then I got a little clearer perspective on what was going on, and I was no less excited by reports of stuff in the sky that, that couldn't be explained. In fact, I was flabbergasted, to be honest with you. Well, I can, I can uh, say with good conscience, my first book that I read about UFOs was uh, Strangers, from the, Strangers in the Sky by Brad Steiger, which was a compendium of UFO sightings, uh, not a mm-hmm. contactee document. So I win on that one, I think, if we were having a contest, I suppose. Yeah, you're right. Well, Brad Steiger's still around, and he's still writing, and he's he's a pretty good researcher. Uh, he is, yes, he, and he just moved to Iowa. So, oh, wow, for those okay. of you who are wondering where he is, he's, uh, I guess, in his 80s now, and uh, still producing all kinds of material. So, uh, And I always kind of liked his research philosophy, which was he was going to accept what you told him uh, as the truth until he found reasons not to believe you anymore. And I think, you know, as a researcher, I always kind of bothered a little bit by that because I think, you know, you, you need to look at everything with a very skeptical eye. But but he was, I guess, less skeptical from, from his point of view, and it worked just well for him. Uh, my first contact with him was on a, a, sight, a sighting, a disappearance that took place in Wales in 1909, and I actually knew where he lived and how to contact him. So I called him and asked him about it, and he said, oh, don't worry about mm-hmm. that case. It's a hoax. And from there, we kind of developed a, a, a keen relationship. And went went on from that. Um, we're gonna have. I I realize I've now talked for most of the most of this segment, but we're gonna have to take a quick break. Uh, for more information about the things we talk about, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And for those of you interested in Roswell, I've just published or published a few weeks ago the uh, Roswell in the 21st Century. It gives you a compendium of that. So we will be b- right back with Rob Zwiatek in just a moment. This is Johanna Carroll, host of Dialogue with Divinity on the Exxon Broadcast Network. While walking along Kanapali Beach in Maui this past year, I kept discovering all these shells and coral in the shape of hearts. My Dialogue with Divinity was very simple. Do you want me to do a retreat to heal people's hearts in Maui next year? And of course, the answer was yes. As a master spiritual teacher, I am offering you a neat retreat called RISE, May 8th through the 12th, 2017, and the chance of a lifetime to rest at a five-star resort for five days and experience a spiritual renewal of your heart and soul. Kanapali is one of the top five beaches in the world. This stunning resort has undergone a $40 million renovation. I walked the entire property, checked out the room choices on your behalf, and I must say, it is stunning. Our conference room faces the ocean with sliding glass doors. Maui is known as Mother Maui because it is a soft, gentle, healing energy. In the embrace of Mother Maui, you will feel yourself rising from the limitations of an ordinary life to an extraordinary journey of peace, bliss, and harmony a greater sense of clarity. Our RISE retreat ignites renewal in the sacred elements of air, water, earth, fire, and wind. There's plenty of free time to enjoy all that Maui has to offer. A small deposit is required now to reserve your space as this retreat, it will sell out. For more details, please go to 
johannacarroll.com and register today. Aloha and I'll see you in mystical Maui. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Mnemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. And we are back with Rob Zwiatek, who has been in ufology for ever and has worked on flying sausage for the USO, USO, UFO, U.S. government. I cannot get that out today. Uh, I thought that was kind of clever that, that your job kind of puts you in touch with flying sausage for the U.S. government. So I thought I'd beat that to death if I possibly could. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's really ironic. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite UFO sighting, something that really got you uh, worked up? Well, like you, it's just, just some of the, the bigger ones that I heard of. I, I, at the time I first sort of slid into ufology, the Exeter, uh, some of the Exeter sightings had just passed. I guess they occurred in 65. So John Fuller's book was out, and I was very impressed by that and, and, the, and the Exeter series of sightings. And uh, there weren't any particularly huge sightings that I knew of at that time in 1968, but but that's certainly one of them that I that I puzzled a great deal over. Uh, that series of sightings out there in, in uh, New Hampshire. And could you give know, us to this day? I'm still puzzled. Well, give us give us a bit of a description of these Exeter sightings. Well, the, the main Exeter sighting was was by a fellow named Muscarello, and I think it occurred around September 3rd or something, 1965, and he was. Uh, he, he was coming in from, I think, Army service or something like that. But, but anyhow, he, he, he saw a rather uh, large uh, discoidal object with lights on it uh, hovering over a farmhouse or near a farmhouse there in, 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 in the middle of the night at midnight or something like that uh, on that date and was tremendously uh, frightened by it. And ultimately, he got in contact with the police and they arrived back out at the, at the location of the sighting maybe that had occurred 45 minutes before that now, and, and the, then it, it reoccurred, and, and both the officer, or maybe, yeah, one officer, I guess it was, and, and Muscarello, you know, saw this, again, had a CE1 encounter and, of, of something very close by and, and lit up, and, uh, you know, they couldn't explain it. Well, by CE1, you mean a close encounter of the first kind, which is basically seeing a craft close at hand, not on the ground, not occupants exactly. from it, but but close at hand. Uh, right. Yeah, I should I should have I should have uh, defined my terms there. But yeah, you're 100 percent correct, Kevin. Uh, Philip Class suggested that because there were high tension lines in the area, that some of these sightings were caused by an ionization of the atmosphere. You've got a, a degree in physics. What did what did you think of Class's explanation for those sightings? Well, yeah, I, I can't say I, I've done my own uh, research on, on on plasma and all this kind of stuff, but but I have read quite a bit about the uh, class's explanations and, and, the, and, the, and the rebuttal to, to it by uh, Dr. James McDonald, who, as you know, was an atmospheric physicist, no longer alive, but he was pretty active uh, in the early 70s and, and late 60s. He looked very closely at uh, class's uh, theories 
and and then and found them basically groundless. He he couldn't account for how either the tension lines could could produce a plasma that would say hover along the uh, hover shortly above the ground, uh, and, and exhibit strange light phenomena, you know, beams of light and 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 take off quickly and and move back and forth, and uh, he he just basically. Uh, canned his explanations as as having any relevance to reality. It's not to say that plasmas don't exist. P plasma is a pretty common form that, that energy takes. A candle flame is a, is a type of a plasma, for example. But uh, they don't move around in an intelligent manner like an aircraft and, and hover and uh, uh, make movements in response to what a human might do. Well, so, Philip Glass and, and but, uh, Dr. McDonald had quite a contentious relationship. Uh, I, I, I think that Glass resented... McDonald uh, crushing his ionization of the atmosphere theory as quickly as he did. Well, yeah, uh, uh, McDonald knew what he was talking about, at least when it came to that uh, aspect of uh, physics. And Philip Klass was a writer for the Aviation Week in Space Technology. I think his, he had a degree in engineering, but that's certainly not the same as having physics and understanding plasma physics. So, Yeah, um, that, that, that's correct. He, he was a pretty smart guy in his own way, but no, he, 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 he didn't have the requisite knowledge to be going about saying uh, that UFOs, a lot of them were due to uh, plasmas hovering outside power. Uh, power lines, and you know, in 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 recent years here, we've had so, sort of had that explanation reprised when the when the British government came out with this thing called the Condine Report or Project Condine here about ten years ago, wherein the uh, the writer who's never been named uh, came to the same conclusion as Class uh, Class basically that all unexplained UFOs or many of them could uh, be explained as uh, plasmas that were flying around, you know, following airplanes, and he even tried to explain abductions with, with plasmas. So uh, I think he should have gone back and read his Jim McDonald, uh, J James McDonald's uh, writings. He would not have come to that conclusion. Well, I was looking at a case that had a plasma involved in it, and I cl called a uh, plasma physicist at the University of Nebraska because I knew him and talked to him about it. And um, suddenly it dawned on me what he was trying to say was that the plasmas, while there are a lot of plasmas in the atmosphere, they don't normally glow. And there has to be some mechanism in the atmosphere or some mechanism that causes them to glow. And, and uh, mm -hmm. that was why I think the uh, idea that the that the the Exeter sightings, for example, were close to high tension lines. That was a mechanism. The the electricity that would escape as it moved along the power lines would be enough to excite the uh, plasmas that cause them to glow. But he didn't he didn't seem to think that was very a very viable explanation. So yeah, and the Muscarello sighting, as I re as I recall, which was sort of the one that kicked off everything. I think a couple sightings actually occurred subsequently. They found out they occurred a little bit before Muscarello, but his actual sighting, I don't think it actually involved any nearby power lines. It was sort of over a farmhouse, and the thing went away, and then it came back. That that type thing. Uh, but but several of the subsequent uh, reports did come from objects that seemed to be hovering above or near power lines. No doubt about that. And then, then you know that's a sighting that goes back to 1965. So we're 50 years in the past here, and I, no, mm -hmm. I noticed I noticed uh, uh, in some of the information I had that uh, you know you work m with MUFON and they're uh, got a what they call the CMS system, and they get a lot of sightings. Is there is there the same kind of robust sightings in 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 the MUFON uh, catalogs that we see uh, that we used to get, or are they just sort of lights in the sky and that sort of thing? No, the, the 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 subject is still pretty pretty robust, Kevin, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I did a little bit of uh, uh, research here to, uh, to to present some pretty up to date information to you on on sightings that come come in on Mufon's case management system. You know, we we call it the CMS. Uh, and, and and real quickly here, let me just summarize how many cases uh, they've received through. Uh, uh, my date, my cutoff date was November 30th of 2016, and the initial date was January 1st of 2016. So in that 11 months, uh, MUFON received uh, a little bit over 3,800 sightings, 3,800 sightings. These are sightings that were alleged to have occurred this year, not sightings that were reported in 2016, but that occurred in some earlier year. So, so you know, 3,800 sightings in 2016. And of those that have been worked on, uh, they have a total of 950 unknown sightings that account for almost 25% uh, of the total is, is unknown sightings. Many remain yet to be worked on. But yeah, the, the cases run the gamut 
of, of, of all the kind of cases we know and love from, from the beginning of uh, UFO history, uh, modern history, 1947, with the exception of, and this is an interesting topic that we could probably spend three or four shows talking about, uh, there, are, there are really not very many CE3 cases where, where you get a, a close, uh, close-up sighting of an object that's involved, uh, that involves an entity or an occupant. Uh, or, or we don't have many car stopping cases that would fall under the CE2 uh, category where an object comes close by a car and, and inter- interrupts the engine or interrupts the, the power going to a home or a building or something like that. They do occur a little bit, but I'd say C- the traditional CE3s are, are almost completely absent from the, uh, the, all, all the uh, sightings that have been coming in. I, I checked uh, today, shortly before the show, to see how many CE3s the MUFON had picked up this year, and there were just a handful of them. And when I read the actual accounts of some of the cases, I wouldn't have called some of them CE3s. Some of them were uh, bedroom encounters that might have been an abduction type thing, but there were not any sightings that I read that involved an actual object and an, and an entity or what appeared to be a living being. So there you have it. And, well, and the that, I mean, from all, all the states, yeah. That, that, that's kind of interesting because I know the more exciting cases are those where you see something, see, some, see a, a creature, see, see an entity, see an alien with it. And if we're not, you know, you're saying in 2016 there really isn't a good CE3 case where the people saw entities? I, I couldn't find one, Kevin, and I, I went through the thing. There were a lot of cases that initially received the CE3 label, but they were subsequently found to be hoaxes or there just, just was not enough information for the investigator to work with to come to any conclusion. And in only a handful of cases did, did they deem that the, uh, the, the case was an unknown. And, and those are the ones I sort of looked at. And like I said, I, didn't, I, I just didn't find anywhere. I walked outside of my house in, in the early morning and there was something in a field across the street and some small being was tinkering around the, what appeared to be a craft on a tripod landing gear. You know, nothing like that. Uh, they were just a little more nebulous than that. Um, CE2 cases, um, things on the ground, were there were a lot of those kind of cases, more of those kind of cases, fewer? What, uh, what's the deal with those? Yeah, well, there, there are more of them, uh, depend, depending on how you, want to, uh, how you want to define your CE2, but many, many cases have, as you would expect, uh, uh, photographs associated with them. So, so that's kind of a, an interaction of the, of the UFO with the witness. I mean, photons reflected off the UFO were picked up by the camera. So, so the MUFON CMS system uh, labels photographic cases as CE2s. But le- leaving out those kind of things, I can't say that we have I, – I didn't run across any car stoppage cases. I didn't look specifically in the, uh, in the file for that, to be honest with you. But it, it, I've had to go over this file uh, twice here in recent months, once for a talk I gave in November, I guess, or in October. And I didn't come across any where uh, a car was stopped. There might have been a few where the power supply was interrupted to a house or something like that. But they, again, are very rare. And and see this kind, this kind of kind of uh, what, what proves the point that I was trying to make is we're not getting the robust kind of cases because you look at the Leveland sightings from 1957 you've got a lot of car stopping cases uh, associated with that not only in the Leveland Texas area on November 2nd but you've got other cases like that you've got those, some from New Mexico the next day um, the uh, craft are burning people. Uh, unintentionally, mm-hmm. you know, like standing in front of the, the sun lamp too long or something like that. And mm-hmm. uh, so you, you've got that kind of cases. In 1973, we had a, a period of about six weeks where there were an awful lot of cases of the craft on the ground and the beings associated with the craft being seen right. um, in, in that, in that, well, that was- six-week period. But now we're, you, you, you don't really have that kind of thing. No, that was the heyday, of, of, or, or maybe that was the curtain call for those kind of cases. It's not to say they haven't occurred in the intervening years from the mid-'70s to now, but the, the drop-off of the curve has been rather extreme. And w- w- one of the things I like to do, and, and if we have time in, in any of the segments here, I can, I can go over a couple of these cases. But w- w- what I'm relegated to, or what an investigator is relegated to, if they want to look at these uh, 3,800 cases that have come into MUFON, are, are cases where the witness was very close to, to the object that they described. And of those cases, there are quite a few. And there's some pretty good ones in there where there is, it's beyond a doubt that either the person saw an unusual object that 
was not man-made or they were just complete liars. And th th those are the only two options you have because the object was within, say, 50 feet of them or 25 feet of them and exhibited unusual shapes and unusual behavior and left the witness in a couple, a couple instances here of 2016 cases really traumatized and, and extremely upset and, and disturbed. And that, 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 that comes across in the account. So uh, I, I find that very interesting in its grist, in its grist for a scientific mill. And I, I, I'm not going to let anybody off the hook on saying, uh, not, 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 and this does not include you because you're not, a, you're not alleging this, but a lot of people are going to dismiss the UFO subject because there aren't any cases where they leave a crushed vegetation anymore or uh, affect a car or maybe creatures are seen. But no, there's, I'm there's have, a lot I'm of great have to, cases where they're close I'm going to have to break in here because we're going to have to take a break, and I realize I'm really yeah. up against it on this one. So we will be back right after this. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, And we are back once again with Rob Zwiatek of the uh, MUFON now, I guess, and formerly of the Fund for UFO Research, which is dormant. 
And uh, before we went away, we were talking about some of the better cases, I guess, from 2016 and wondering if there was some uh, where they people saw the thing on the ground, some good, good cases where they were close. And you said that you had a couple of those lined up for. So can you give us some of the details? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do, Kevin. And uh, and anybody who doesn't isn't convinced that there's anything to the UFO subject needs to look into these kind of cases. Uh, the, the, the first one I wanted to just kind of briefly describe occurred in uh, January 14th of this year, and, and it's, an, it's a radar uh, visual sighting. In, in this case, it was an Airbus 321 uh, passenger aircraft, which was going uh, from uh, San Francisco to Philadelphia. And, and the pilot uh, radioed into the, uh, the control center, and he, he was over at a place called Levan, Utah, L-E-V-A-N, Utah, Wondering, the pilot wondered what the uh, large orange square was that he could see uh, off the nose of his aircraft. And uh, at, at first, the control center said uh, they weren't picking it up on radar. This turned out to be a lie. And uh, subsequently, wait, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you say this is a lie? Yeah, be, because when the uh, there's a little bit of a backstory here, and man, I, I'm. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have used this case because it's a little complicated. But, but basically, when the pilot radioed into the control center asking what the orange object was and whether they had it on radar, uh, the control center said, uh, no, we're not tracking that thing. Some minutes later, i.e. 10 minutes later, so, and, and this whole conversation was heard by a ham radio operator on the ground. And the, the pilot again asked what, what, what he was seeing uh, off the nose of his aircraft, and the and, and the air traffic control center said something like, "Wow, is it on the right side of your aircraft?" Well, now the pilot never said it was on the right side, but it turned out to be. And this this uh, conversation was picked up by this ham radio operator, who subsequently got in touch with MUFON, and the the MUFON investigator, in, in conjunction with a radar expert that that MUFON retains, uh, requested the records from the FAA. So we got the uh, a little bit of the recording between the pilot and the uh, and, and the air traffic control center, and we got the radar tapes. And well, this thing this thing can, shows. Well, this thing concerns me greatly because because if you've got an object in the air around the airliner, um, I mean, part of the FAA responsibility, air traffic control responsibility, is keep separation on the objects in the sky, I mean, keeping airplanes from flying into each other. And if the the object was the object close enough to, to worry the pilot? Uh, was it coming at them? Was it pacing him? What was it doing? Well, it was pacing him, but the, the radar uh, uh, files or tapes uh, in, indicate that the object was 12 miles away. That's pretty far. Um, and, and the object, as seen on the radar scope, uh, has, a, has, has kind of a strange behavior. It, the, the radar scope, scope shows a cluster of objects, three to five objects, uh, or one, one to three objects, something like that, darting around and sometimes clumped together and ex exhibiting, ex exhibiting a very inex inexplicable behavior. And the, the radar analyst who looked at these, uh, at these tapes, uh, uh, a fellow named Puckett, uh, said it was most curious. He couldn't, he couldn't come up with any uh, logical explanation for what would cause those kind of radar returns. He ruled out anomalous propagation. He ruled out another aircraft. He, he ruled out drones and all this kind of stuff. He said it could be a single object that was turning on its axis so that uh, maybe corners of the object, different portions of the object were reflecting the radar rays. It obviously didn't have a responder. Uh, he, he could not explain it at all. That description of the radar seems to be a little bit uh, at odds with, with the pilot apparently reported a, a large orange square of some type in the air at some distance from his aircraft. It, it seemed to be kind of close, but we don't have too much of the radar, I mean, of the pilot's conversation. He, he wasn't uh, verbose, and uh, we don't even have his name, so we can't follow up with an interview on him. But nonetheless, that's how matters shake out there. And there seems to be part of the uh, conversation with the pilot that has been redacted from the tapes. And this is something that Puckett could only determine from looking at the, the, the physical tapes he got and running them through a computer. Uh, he saw remnants of a, an earlier conversation, that part of the conversation wherein the pilot asked the traffic control center whether they were picking up an object on radar. And uh, that part has been deleted. So our only knowledge of that has come from this ham radio operator. So, so a bit of a complicated case, but yet it seems uh, something 
kind of, kind of odd occurred there over the skies uh, above Utah there in January. Well, I guess the thing that strikes me, as I said, is you've got an object on radar that is around a, a commercial airliner, and it seems as if the radar operators aren't too concerned about it, even though, I mean, if it's 12 miles away and it's really not moving toward the aircraft, uh, I mean, it's not that much of a danger, but still, I would I, I would think that that would be some kind of a problem that they, they have, especially, I, I would imagine the aircraft was at uh, cruising altitude, 30, 35,000 feet. And yeah, the object, it was at 31,000. And the object was at the same flight levels, uh, basically the same flight level, below or above uh, the airplane? Yeah, yeah the, the, the radar didn't have an, doesn't have an altitude, uh, an altitude range associated with it. Some radars do. This particular one didn't, uh, Puckett was telling me in a conversation. And that's been true for a long time with about a lot of radars. The, the, at least the radar was about 100 miles away from the aircraft, and it wasn't uh, picking – it couldn't tell what the altitude was above the ground of the, uh, of the uh, unexplained signals. But the pilot indicated uh, – the, the ham radio operator who was listening to the pilot indicated that as time went on, the pilot was getting more agitated in, 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 with his requests and in his uh, conversation. And um, and he, he wanted to know what that thing was, and and and, and he did indicate that it was pacing or seemed to be you know following his uh, along uh, with his aircraft. So the pilot was quite becoming concerned about the object in the air with exactly him. right, exactly right. And uh, but the, the sighting first occurred about 12:05 a.m. I think it was on the 14th of January. And uh, it basically ended at about 12:30, half an hour later, and, and that's is, that's the envelope of the uh, for, for the request of data that that Puckett asked for. He asked for any data between 12 and 12:30, and so we don't know if something happens say at quarter to one. Wouldn't but, the uh, FAA be required to report this? Uh, this this I, you know, anomalous. I honestly don't know. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know, Kevin. Uh, you, so, so I hesitate to say they, they should be or not. I, I, you would think they would be extremely concerned about what was seen up there. Now, now, some people said, well, something was burning on the ground, and the pilot saw something burning on the ground, like a field or a controlled burn or something like that. But bear in mind, it was illegal to have controlled burns you know, at 1230 in the morning. And moreover, it's a desert territory underneath the aircraft. There are no extensive fields of brush and, and, and trees and vegetation. And the investigators went out and you know, drove around that area that corresponded to where the pilot had, had been above and didn't find any burned fields. And they, they combed through newspapers, didn't find reports of you know, the fire department being called out. So when all is said and done, we're left with an unexplained uh, sighting not too far from an aircraft. But what's more important, you know, they're saying, well, it was fire on the ground, but it was seen on the radar. So what, when was the last time a fire on the ground was seen on the radar? Exactly, exactly. And the fact that the radar was about 100 miles distant from the aircraft, again, rules out anomalous propagation, a lot of anomalous propagation. Not all of it, not all of it occurs fairly close to where the beam emanates from the, uh, from the transmitter. And they, then, then the beam can pick up stuff on the ground and buildings and traffic and stuff like this. But 100 miles out, that, the, the beam is pretty far above the ground, and the aircraft was at 31,000 feet. Uh, and, and, and some of this radar can pick up uh, smoke and stuff like that, and, and, and weather radar can. And there was no indication uh, on weather radar that, that any smoke or anomalous propagation was being, was being recorded. Well, speaking of weather radar, there's weather radars in the cockpit of the aircraft. Did he see anything on his radar? Was there any conversation that would have led you to that conclusion? Uh, there's, there's no conversation on that. If, if he was picking up anything, he, he, he apparently didn't uh, voice these concerns to the, uh, to the ground. And Well, and, and if he didn't done that, then the, the high amount radio operator who was listening in wouldn't have heard that heard anything no, like he, that. He didn't, report, he didn't report that either. No, he did not report that either, which would have been a significant thing in, in, the, uh, in the case uh, investigation. But no, that, that didn't come out at all. I know in some, some UFO sightings, uh, the cockpit radars do pick up the objects. Uh, with the Japanese JAL-1628, I think it was, mm -hmm. they, had, they had indications on their cockpit radi uh, radars that um, something was close by. 
Uh, yeah, we're, we're really hamstrung here because we don't ha- know the identity of the pilot. And in fact, the pilot didn't even identify himself to air traffic control when he first called. The, the air traffic control had to actually ask him, interrogate him, you know, who are you? What's your name? I know they were picking up a transponder reading, but they actually had to ask him, who, who are you and what flight is this before he said something. Well, did he I give his... He just said flight number. He didn't give his name. I was going to say, that's what I was, that was what I was going to ask. Did he yeah. just respond no, to the no, flight no, number? No, no, no. No, it was we we just know the the flight number. Uh, I, and there's no I way to trace. Here, it, there was no way to trace the pilot from the flight number. Uh, apparently not. Uh, again, I haven't been in contact with the investigator per se. I talked to the radar fellow here, Puckett, but apparently they they were not able to do that because that would have yielded a lot of information. But uh, they haven't been able to get his name. Uh, is, I know the is, flight number, but that's that's about it. The company, the airline company, is not responding with his name, or have they? What, what kind of response have they gotten from the uh, the airline? Yeah, I, I don't know on that one, uh, Kevin. It's, it's not indicated in the uh, in the write up on the case. All I know is uh, Puckett was saying it's it's too damn bad. We we can't get the name of the uh, the pilot because then we could uh, get a lot more information on this case. But yeah, it's, it's just it's just not available to us. I, I'm sure they've tried and they've gone as far as they can, but. Uh, uh, we, it's American Airlines Flight 434, and that's as that's as good as it gets. <laughs> well, now we know what airline to stay away from. They, <laughs> their pilots see UFOs. No, I shouldn't say that. That was me. Uh, <clears throat> or if you want to see a UFO, you take American <laughs> Airlines. <laughs> uh, uh, but I mean, that's kind of the response you get from a lot of people too. Is well, the, the pilots are up there seeing UFOs. Can, well, can we trust that airline? And that I, that's an outgrowth of the entire UFO field from from back in 1947. And the one thing, and I think I've mentioned it on the show before, that uh, one of the um, Newspaper in in 1947, after the the first of the wave of UFOs were reported, flying saucers were reported, was said the flying saucers are flying this scene in 38 states except Kansas, because Kansas at the time was a dry state, and so you didn't have yeah, the drugs out there that. seeing seeing bizarre. Well, you yeah, I'm sure you were familiar with that one as well. Uh, you said something about drones. Is there problems with drones now being reported as well, UFOs? I- yeah, obviously there are. You can only imagine that there's a gazillion of these crazy drones out there in all different sizes and shapes that people are flying around. They're, they're obviously not flying them, at least amateurs like I would be, are uh, not flying them at 31,000 feet. But yeah, that, I, I think that's proving to be a problem with for, uh, for, for MUFON and for uh, investigative uh, UFO groups, no doubt. Uh, and uh, movie footage or uh, video footage, pictures of drones in the distance that uh, causing trouble. Yeah, yeah, in, in, invariably, invariably they do, Kevin. Uh, one one of the problems with with the, uh, the the MUFON system is is we 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 do get an awful lot of uh, of pictures and and videos and you know phone video and 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 other video and. Man, a lot, a lot of it really hasn't improved in quality since the 1950s. And you know, and you know what I'm talking about: a blurred light in the sky, or just a light with nothing around it to show context in a black sky. We're still getting all those kind of things. Only well, more of them. Well, we're going to have to take a quick break here because uh, we're coming up against the uh, against the bumper here. Uh, when we come back, we will talk a little bit more with Rob Zwiatek about what uh, is going on with MUFON and hoaxes and photographs and that sort of thing. And for more information, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And for those of you who are interested, take a look at the uh, xzbn.net uh, on your computer and you'll get some good information there as well. We will return shortly. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, 
Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secret to everything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secret to everything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And we are back with Rob Zwiatek, uh, who's a, a bo- on the board of directors at MUFON. And for those of you who are interested in more information about what we're talking about, um, in these cases, you might take a look at the MUFON website. Just type MUFON.com into your, into your search engine. It'll come up, and you can uh, see what's going on with them. And you can also take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. So we are back with Rob, and he was going to – I had some questions in mind, but he mentioned uh, while we were away that he had a case that was uh, quite interesting. So I'm just going to throw it to him and let him chat about that. Rob, you got the floor. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Please break in with any questions if I get too confusing or something. Uh, yeah, I had a bunch of cases, but this is a good one because we're, we're short on time, as always, in life. And uh, this, this is a case that occurred in, in April of 2016 over a place called Grove City, Ohio. And, and the, the case took about two minutes. 
uh, in duration. Uh, there, there was a witness on the ground. Um, and, and after I described this case, and it can be done fairly quickly, I'll tell you about the really interesting correlation I found in a much earlier case, which at least to me was uh, uh, sort of blew my mind. But, but anyhow, the, the witness was outside at about 7.15 or so in the evening and saw what was described as three to five dark colored circles uh, moving from north to south, and the witness thought they were perhaps 15,000 feet high in the sky. But they moved as a group uh, a a along a straight line north to south. But the odd thing was that as these objects, these, he said they were dark circles, who knows if they were disks or whatever, they weren't rings, they were dark and circular. And a as they went along, the, they would form a pattern. And it began as a circle, and then the, the objects rearranged themselves into an arc, then into a V-shape, then into an open triangle, then a, then a wing, and then they came full circle, no pun intended, back to a circle again. But the interesting thing was that when these objects formed into these patterns, they did so instantaneously. There seemed to be no connection between the circles, one with another. There, there were no lines seen or the solid structure was not seen. The witness could see the sky between the objects. And in a split second, the objects would go from, say, the circle to the triangle or the triangle to the wing. So you could not see the objects move between them. And he said it was like between the patterns. And the witness said it was like someone threw a switch uh, on and, and the objects would rearrange themselves. And, and eventually they just vanished into the distance, actually headed toward a storm, a, 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 a line of storm clouds or something like that in the south. But nonetheless... Uh, very, very puzzling sighting. Now let's go 62 years bef back in time, if you will. And I came across this sighting from some records I had from Richard Hall, who used to be the uh, uh, chairman of the Fund for UFO Research and a good friend of mine and, and a legendary uh, UFO researcher. Kevin knows w well of whom I speak. And, and this was notes that Richard made on a case that occurred on August 1st, 1952 over Albuquerque, New Mexico in the evening. And uh, a fellow saw uh, about, about 10 glowing white objects moving across the sky. And these 10 objects were clustered together. At first, he didn't see that they had any uh, pattern to them, and they were headed north. And as he watched, these lights shifted to a perfect V in a very precise manner. And then a few seconds later, they formed an, a, a new pattern. It happened to be two rows, parallel rows or something like that, with one row fitting in the gaps of the other row. And it moved across the sky like this. And the witness said their shifts in position were incredibly swift and fantastically violent. And so here, here we have the same object, the same phenomenon occurring 62 years before the one in Grove City, Ohio, where a person saw, okay, it was the lights in one case, it was dark circles in another. One was late at night, one was early in the evening. But here the objects are switching instantaneously seemingly from one pattern to another. And I, I just found that to be completely fascinating. And, and the witness said they made a flying saucers believer out of me with respect to the Albuquerque, New Mexico case. And, and this art, an article on this case appeared in, in, in a newspaper at the time. So uh, that's how we know about this case. But, but anyhow, here we have one of those very, very interesting correlations that sometimes occurs in ufology where it's, this is not a mundane sighting. It's a kind of a complicated sighting. And yet, I, I'm, in my own mind, I'm convinced that these, these two people saw this, the same objects. Well, you're saying what the same object? That there, Kevin? Well, the same well, object. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the same type of object, let's put it that way. I was going to say, or, or a, yeah. a group of not, objects not from the same, same source. Object. A, a, right. a, objects from the same source doing the same sort of right. maneuvers. Are yeah, there not, are, not, not the actual object, don't get me wrong there, but no, it was that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, it, I, I see that this, it only takes a couple cases like this before you realize that you don't need complicated Roswell type incidents. If you only need a few cases like this to realize that something really is going on that's inexplicable in our skies. Well, here's one thing and, that's always, always kind of, I've always kind of wondered about, we have lots of pictures of flying saucers, UFOs, but we really don't have pictures that match one another, you know, taken at different times in different locations by different people. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you think of a case where we've got virtually the same sort of object uh, taken, taken uh, a picture taken at uh, widely separated times, uh, in widely separated locations? 
No, I, I, I really can't. Uh, well, actually, I can sort of. Uh, not, wow, you came out of the blue with that question. And th there were a series of photographs <laughs> taken, and in one case, a video, where a an object was described as looking like a sphere with a square ring around it. And um, one of these cases was taken, I think, over Budapest, and another one was taken, boy, I want to say it was in Hawaii or something. I think it was a video that Bruce Maccabee looked at. But in each case, it was a sphere with a square ring. And one was, yeah, one was taken over Kauai in Hawaii, a series of photographs. And uh, then we had a video from Japan that showed a sphere with a square ring. So in these three or four cases scattered over time and space, we have almost exactly the same objects uh, pictured in the uh, photographs. Which would suggest if, if you were a hoaxer, you wouldn't be picking that kind of a weird object uh, to, to a hoax. You'd pick something that would be a bit more dean like you see in the, the TV movies or the, the, I shouldn't say TV movies, the, the movies, uh, Earth versus the Flying Saucers type thing. Exactly, exactly. And some of these cases were multiple witness cases. They, they, they were pretty good, but virtually unknown to the field of ufology as a whole. You'd, you'd have to do a lot of work to find out where these cases are in the uh, uh, UFO journals and in, in the files. Well, I can, help on, I can help on one of them. I think the, uh, the Hawaii case was actually featured in U official UFO magazine in the uh, 1970s. It was on the cover of the magazine, and you've got the palm trees and the hula girls and all of that. I don't remember the issue, but I remember the, the object, and I think that's the one you're talking about. So Yeah, yeah I think no, actually it's a different one. Um, I, 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 because I, I sometimes vacation in Kauai, and the hotel where this object was photographed, I think it was photographed in like 1980 or something, um, or and maybe 1970, whatever. But yeah, it was, uh, it, it doesn't show palm trees because the object had a high vertical elevation above the horizon. And, and, and co color photographs were taken, I think a couple of them were taken. But yeah, I know exactly where in Hawaii that was because I've been in that actual little hotel, it's still there. And um, it, it's an inexplicable kind of a case. It, the, the photographs are quite good, actually. They're, they're fairly clear, and Maccabee did a good investigation of the case and uh, just drew a blank at the end of it. And for those who are interested, Bruce Maccabee is a uh, physicist who worked for the uh, U.S. Navy for a period of time, well, for his career, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's Dr. Bruce Maccabee, and you can find him um, by searching the web and that sort of thing if you are interested in more information about who Dr. Maccabee is and what his research has uh, shown over the years. Uh, we got just a couple of minutes left here, and I just wanted to ask you one quick question. Um, are hoaxes causing you guys a lot of trouble? Yeah, yeah, they, they pose a problem, um, and it's something that all the investigators are cognizant of. Uh, they, they do find that hoaxes to be a relatively small percentage of, of, of the cases. I, the Air Force always found they were around 3 to 5%. I don't know what the MUFON uh, I, the percentage of, of cases being a hoax is, but I think it's in that same ballpark. Let uh, me, let me, let me rephrase yeah, yeah, the that, question. That's, that's the problem. Let me rephrase the question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Hoax videos that show up on, on YouTube, are those causing trouble? Only if someone submits them to the CMS system where then somebody really has to look into them. That, that, to, to be honest with you and to be frank, the, the photographic cases are a big problem for MUFON, hoaxes as well as genuine ones, because we don't have enough photo analysts to go through literally, I would probably think several hundred uh, a year. And we have a, a fellow named Mark D'Antonio, but he, can't, he has a regular job. He can't spend full time looking at these things. And there aren't too many qualified people who can sit down and parse these sightings to say, oh, this is a hoax. This is uh, maybe genuine. But I can say that the quality of a lot of them that I've looked at is people just sort of shove anything under the transom. And some of them are pretty bad. Like just, it's just a smudge of light in, the, in a dark sky. And it, it could be a genuine UFO, whatever the UFOs are. But there just isn't enough information to work on. And they sort of just uh, use up a lot of time, and 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 uh, and that, that's the problem with these. There aren't a lot of really great, clearly obvious, uh, obviously unidentified cases out there in, in terms of photographs. So MUFON doesn't I have. I wish somebody, there were. MUFON doesn't have somebody trolling YouTube looking for the the videos that are thrown up there, uh, uh, almost on a daily basis, to see if any of those yeah, things. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you've got to you've got to fill out your case management form if you're an, an, a witness and put in a bunch of information where you saw it, what time it was taken, who you are, how you can be contacted. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to just put an anonymous thing up there. And I'm not so sure that they'll assign an anonymous uh, case to inv investigators. Uh, they, there has to be a point of contact so you can interact with the witness and, and, and interview him or her. Well, and, Rob, uh, Rob, we've just run out of time here. I want to thank you for coming on to the program and sharing your information with us about what's going on in 2016 and that sort of thing. And uh, we will be back next week with uh, Robert Schaefer, who is uh, a skeptic of, of UFOs and that sort of thing. And for those of you who want more information, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And uh, take a look at the MUFON website if you want to learn more about UFOs. We will return in 167 hours with a new program. Thank you for dropping by. Mm -hmm.